Now then, forces loyal to the Syrian president Bashar al-Assad have continued their assault on opposition strongholds. Now they attacked the central city of Homs for a 12th straight day. The people living in Homs have been through some of the deadliest assaults. Now, activists say almost a thousand have been killed in the last two weeks alone. Opposition areas also targeted in southwestern Dera. The uprising began there almost a year ago and it still contains pockets of resistance. Activists say more people are joining the Free Syrian Army. This defection took place in Homs and uh, there was another in Hama. The UN General Assembly plans to vote later on a resolution condemning the Syrian government. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says Assad's crackdown could amount to crimes against humanity. Okay, let's speak to Robert Fisk, uh, foreign correspondent for the UK's independent newspaper, joining us now from Tunisia's capital. Tunis, uh, Robert, welcome to the programme. Good to see you there. Um, I just wanted to examine the, the military capability of the opposition. You have the FSA, the Free Syrian Army, but, and it's, it's purportedly called an army, but is it an army as such, or is it, is it a sort of band of, of disparate entities? It's an army in quotation marks. That's what I call it. Look, um, you don't have an army until you have armor, tanks, armored personnel carriers, backed up by air cover, for example. And until there are serious defections from the Syrian government military forces, a tank brigade, an infantry division, uh, something which has real armor, you ain't got no army, I'm sorry. Uh, sure, they've got Kalashnikovs, but you can't use a Kalashnikov with effect against tanks. What is happening at the moment, I think, is that in order not to persuade more soldiers to defect, the Syrian army is not using its full firepower. It doesn't feel like this in Homs, probably, but it's not using its full firepower in the way it did in Hama in 1982, for example, when more than 10,000 people were killed, because of the fear that such enormous um, violence against Syrian people, whether they be armed or not, would simply alienate whole units of the Syrian army itself. So on the one hand, the free Syrian army is an army in quotation marks, but the actual army has limitations which it didn't have in the past. Limitations not of weaponry, plenty of that from Russia, but of the ability to use it without turning more soldiers against the government. Right, which makes you think it's just going to keep on going on and on. Uh, and meanwhile, you have this, this growing sound of chatter in the background of, of countries potentially talking about, potentially arming the opposition. and. That's a dangerous game, isn't it? Yeah, you're talking about the Chatter League, better known as the Arab League. Um, a bit tougher now that Qatar is basically running the show. Um, I think it's dangerous. It's dangerous for several reasons, because, of course, in effect, what the Arab League is doing is it's using the war in Syria to attack Iran. And in doing so, it's, it's allowing Syrians to bleed in the streets for the particularly Saudi-led um, coalition against Iran itself. Uh, this is extremely cynical, it's extremely hypocritical, but that's why it's happening. The idea that the kings and emirs and monarchs of the Gulf, who what, don't want to even hear the word democracy, would feel so sorry for the <laughs> democracy protesters in Syria is ridiculous, though they claim that they are. Um, what they're really trying to do, of course, is get rid of Shiite power, Alawite power in Syria, allow the Sunnis to take over and then hopefully control them, though that may not happen. So, so this talk of weapons, if it was to happen, how would they get armed through to uh, the FSA and, and who would they give it to, given the, what we've been discussing and the fact that you've got, as I say, disparate entities here? Well, look, there are weapons going in from Lebanon. The Lebanese government denies it, but there are weapons going in from Lebanon. But again, rocket-propelled grenades, you can use them on old tanks, and Kalashnikovs and lots and lots of ammunition. But if you want serious weapons, mortars, field artillery, even of small calibre, it's going to have to come in from Turkey. Jordan's not going to involve itself at the moment in any such project. But the Turks have talked about it. They alternatively get very, very angry, then they become a little more mollified, then they get very, very angry indeed. And I think if the Turks plan to have this much talked about cordon sanitaire in the north of Syria, you know, a free fire zone in effect, which the uh, Syrian army free could move into, uh, then that's the way heavier weapons could get in. But I still think we're a long way away from that. People keep saying, you know, about to topple, the regime's about to go. You've got to remember that the Ba'ath Party has claws in the soil of Syria and it's very difficult to pull them out. Right, and to pull them out, uh, you need the FSA or the opposition armed groups to be, to be united. Uh, but are they racked with division? How united are they? 
uh, totally. Uh, I met some of the opposition in Istanbul a few weeks ago. And I was very struck by the fact that uh, when they met any foreign delegation, whether it be Russian, Turkish, which is foreign for them, or other Arab delegation, uh, the, the only message that came from their would-be allies was, for goodness sake, speak with one voice. And they don't, because every time you see a new group, whether it be very militant, whether it be more Islamist, and you've got to remember the militants in Homs are becoming very Islamist. There are beheadings taking place of uh, government supporters around Homs, as there were before the siege of Hama in 1982. Uh, very serious things are happening. And I think that, um, you know, at the moment, uh, we are at an impasse, and I think that probably um, uh, President Assad, who's now, of course, putting forward his referendum plans, he still believes there'll be a referendum, he's still able to breathe. And as I say, I think the Ba'ath Party will cling on for quite a while yet. The idea that um, Assad is about to topple is wrong. The world may groan at the thought, but we have to deal with the facts. OK, let's hypothetically say that the Assad uh, government does topple, and in a post-Assad era, people have concerns about uh, what may fill the void. And given everything we've been talking about, it sounds as if those fears are, are quite legitimate. I think there will be much violence if the Syrian regime falls. Um, I was talking uh, four days ago in the northern Lebanese city of Tripoli to a very prominent politician who's half Alawi himself and whose cousin, the son of a landowner, was telling him over the telephone from a village near Homs, you know, he said, I'm anti-Assad, I'm anti the regime, but when they come for revenge, they're not going to ask me if I'm anti-Assad or not. They're going to come for me. Um, I do also think, and I'm just, I'm not doing a, a fisc balancing act here, but I think we also have to understand this. Supposing the regime survives, what kind of Syria will it inherit? That's also an important question. How can it deal with another Syria? Well, so many questions, Robert Fisk, and uh, you've done your very best to answer them. We appreciate that very much. Thanks very much for joining us on the programme. Thank you.